to celebrate Christmas, uh, I brought this subject, Jesus yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So we can, you know, think deeply in what really Christmas means to us. Uh, we all know, we all can read many articles uh, in people that analyze this time of, um, you know, shopping and spending money and, you know, eating and all these things that we do to celebrate Christmas. But many times forgetting completely that Christmas means, you know, birthday of Jesus Christ. So let's try to see Jesus and Christmas in a different way that we are used to. That's why the, the, the subject yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Because normally when we think of Jesus, we see this man 2,000 years ago walking these dusty uh, roads, talking to shepherds and uh, fishermen, etc. And we forget the most important moment of his mission here, which was the resurrection. Because, of course, he came 2,000 years ago, and he lived at that time with that, those people, so he had to say things, he had to teach them according to their uh, uh, understanding, their knowledge, and that's why it's sometimes very difficult for us to figure out what he really meant when he said <coughs> many things. Because we, had, we have to understand the culture of that, that time, the language, and uh, a lot of things that prevent us from understanding completely. But anyway, as Alain Kardec in the Spirit's book say, what really matters, and uh, there is no um, discussion, argument about that, is the moral teachings, which are universal teachings. We can find this in any uh, uh, philosophy that preach uh, progress and goodness, which is love, respect for others, uh, understanding, indulgence, uh, uh, mercy, etc. So his lessons are lessons for the eternity. And uh, this opening read, reading uh, talks about, you know, his... Uh, um, sacrifices, the hardships that he uh, endured to teach us how to do the same. Because he knew that living in the material planet that is constantly in this uh, 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 evolvement, uh, progressing, things are never the same. Because what we see here is not God's work is man work. Whatever we see in our, in our society is man work. So God's work is life itse in itself. But the way we organize our societies, the way we structure our lives is our work. So for us, to live in a world that was structured by ourselves, socially speaking, Jesus knew that we should be very courageous because being imperfect, we did a lot of imperf imperfect things, and not only imperfect, but harmful things in our society. We see the injustice everywhere. That is not God's will because we have this saying, oh, God knows. This is uh, God's will. No, God's will is love for everybody, health for everybody. But for us to achieve that, we have to work. This is God's will. We have to work to better our society. But that is no revolution that will do the job, but the inner revolution. Sorry. So the only way to change things is changing ourselves. We have this urge to change people that live with us because we see uh, in them so many problems, so many uh, uh, imperfections, so many things that we don't like. Then 
we wanted to be uh, 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 happier than we are. So the first thing that comes to our minds is, I have to fix my husband. I have to fix my wife. I have to fix my brother, my, my co-worker, or my boss, whoever lives with me. I want to change them, then I can be happy. It's completely wrong. We will never achieve that. Because the only way to change my wife, my husband, my kids, my boss, is changing myself. The way I react to their actions, to their behaviors. So it's the other way around. When I start changing myself, bettering myself, being more indulgent, be more compassionate, I start changing people around me. Not everybody, of course. So this we have also to understand. We will never affect everybody's life. We will affect some, the ones that are ready to understand. Like Jesus, 2,000 years ago, he came and he taught us so many teachings. And he's still waiting because he knew that each one of us, we have our own pace. And he respects that as we should respect also other people's pace because they need also to respect, to respect our pace. So living in society is fundamental for us to progress. There is no evolution without being together. And, uh, you know, it's like the stones in the river as they, uh, they follow the, 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 f the flow, the water, they like touch each other and uh, after millions of years they are all smooth. So that's the way society works on, on us. We create that society that's a little uh, uh, disturbed society and then we have to live in because it's our creation. Then we have to live in. We have to experience what we have done. Then by experience that we start to understand, wow, this is not good. And then we start changing ourselves and others start changing. And there is no doubt that in the future, our planet will be uh, upgraded to a better kind of planet where uh, uh, peace, love, health will be a common good for everyone that's living here. So. In this book, Jesus at Home, from Chico Xavier and Neo Lucio. Neo Lucio is the, the spirit that uh, channeled, uh, Chico Xavier channeled Neo Lucio. Uh, there's two chapters that is very, are very interesting chapters. One, the, the chapter three, the master's explanation, and the seven, the greatest servant. In the chapter three, they have this meeting at Peter's house. Because this book is all about, you know, meetings at Peter's house, at John's house. And Jesus is talking to uh, uh, the apostles, their family members, their friends that they invited. And they are there talking about, you know, everyday problems. And Jesus would come with some uh, suggestions. So uh, in the chapter 3, the master's explanation, um, the... Peter's mother, she, she doesn't understand how can she really keep the teachings of Jesus because she, th she thinks it's so difficult to apply to their lives that, you know, she asked Jesus, how can we do? And Jesus asked her because she was a, well, again, Jesus asked her, what is the main work of your house? And she said, well, we, uh, we have some goats and uh, we have the, the, the milk and then we can produce uh, 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 cheese, etc." And Jesus said, well, how can you keep the, the milk in order for the milk to, to be not to spoil? spoil? And then she said, well, I have to clean the pots very well cleaned. Because if some, you know, 
does so some uh, 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 um, dirty things stay in the in the in the pot, this will make the the milk uh, uh, be spoiled. And then Jesus said, "Well, same thing happens to the kingdom of heaven within ourselves." You know, the love, the the teachings come pure, but in order for these teachings to have its purity within ourselves, we have to clean our own face. The more we clean ourselves from all the uh, imperfections, the more we will show through our own uh, uh, behavior and actions the pureness of the, the kingdom of heaven. That's why in our society we have you know, this pattern of people that are both good and bad. Because we have this, the shadow and we have the light within ourselves. And then that's, it, this is about how much shadow I have, how much light I have. So for a long time, we will still have this pattern on earth. People that are good and bad, that are sad and happy, and this is the way it is. It's up to us to clean our vase, to reflect more the kingdom of hev heaven within ourselves. And uh, in the chapter 7, it's uh, Matthew that asks Jesus, Master, who is the greatest servant in the kingdom of heaven? And then Jesus tells them a, a, a story. He says, well, you know, in a, in a village, in a small village, there was this man that came and uh, brought his uh, army ideas. And he started training the young man to build this army and protect themselves. And then they start doing all these exercises and, and buying uh, weapons, etc. And they build this army. When this man left, he left behind him this strong community, but there was no progress because they were only concerned about defending themselves without building anything else. And then another man came and was a philosopher. And he came and he brought all these wonderful ideas that helped the, 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 the people to develop their intelligence, their you know, reasoning, and left. When, they, when he left, he left behind him some improvements, but a lot of troubles, because people now were doubting, even if they existed themselves. And then came a priest, and the priest came and taught them how to kneel before God, how to do all the, the sacraments, etc., and left. Well, behind them, behind him, we now see this small community all uh, uh, committed to these exterior actions of devotion without having uh, 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 any in spiritual improvement. And then came a politician and divided the, the, the village, you know, the young against the old, the women against men, the sick against the healthy, and you know, many parties came out from this, his ideas, and he left. Well, now that they had this, uh, um, how to say, um, forget the word. Segregation. Not the segregation. They have the, um, when you have two companies that produce something and they, competition. 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 From the competition amongst the, the parties, well, some progress was made also, but not, nothing substantial for the peace. And then came another man that brought nothing but his goodwill. And he started working the soil. And he 
he, had, uh, he prepared an orchard and he started teaching people how to produce fruits and vegetables and then later he built a school and he taught people how to write, how to read, etc. And then he left. When he left, the community now was able to keep the progress going on because he, have, uh, he had uh, sold in their hearts the love for the work, working for the improvement of the community. So Jesus uh, uh, um, concluded the, the story that the greatest servant is the one that wor worked the most without waiting anything for himself. So the way for us to progress and make progress without is wanting recompense. without wanting recompense. recompense. In another wonderful book, Bliss, uh, uh, Blissful Days, uh, from Divaldo Franco and Amelia Rodriguez, um, Amelia Rodriguez says, there were no vain promises in his speeches. He, she's talking about Jesus nor support for the futile attitudes. He was whole, always the same in his proposal, discussion, and conclusion. His way of saying things was unique, clear, never su surpassed. What is interesting here is that Jesus came and he contagiated millions or billions of people throughout history, and he never promised a good life easy things. He promised work, but the recompense, recompense for the work is peace, is well-being. And that's why only the ones that work without waiting for a recompense can understand Jesus, because it's not about intellectual, it's about feeling. When we really uh, follow his very challenging advices, we start feeling something different. We start feeling stronger, happier, calmer, more understanding, and it, it feels so good that we want to experience this more and more and more. That's why we see so many uh, uh, good examples of people that transformed their lives so much that they became really uh, these examples for everybody else. But this is something that is felt and not understood only. He was compassionate towards the one who had failed, but not towards the error. He supported the sick, however, preached liberation from the illness. He helped the sinner, moreover, talked about fighting the sin. He gave a hand to the defeated, pushing him or her to victory upon himself or herself by lifting the inner, their inner strength. He didn't accuse or condemn, nor did he approve crimes, perversion, or moral promiscuity. So this also is something that shows us why he was not um, accepted by every, everybody, because, you know, he would help us, but after helping us, he would come and say, don't do this anymore. Change your life. When the, the, the man brought the ad adulterous women, woman, for him to say if they could stone her because she was caught in adultery, what he said, nothing. He kept quiet and according to the spirits, he was writing with his finger in the dust some mistakes that we commit. And uh, as the men that were there waiting for his response saw the mistake they have committed, they start going away. Because Jesus said, well, if you don't have any mistake or sin, let's, let's change the word because sin is a, it's a, 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 
a um, word that brings a lot of problems. So mistake is, well, no, sin is mistake. Committing a sin is committing a mistake. So when I was there and I saw the mistake I have committed, but well, I cannot stone her because I, I do this. And then everyone left and the woman was there. He didn't come to her and say, poor you, you know, go home and rest. He said, well, where are they, those that condemned you? They left. And he said, well, nor I will condemn you. Go and see no more. Go and don't make the same mistake. Because if we make the same mistake, what's the consequence of it? Getting the same result. Or ev uh, um, always the same result. So he was for us people, but he would tell us right away where we were wrong, what we should improve in ourselves. Because his goal was transforming ourselves and not you know, saying, poor you. We have a, another wonderful book, Jesus, Mas Master and Save, oh, sorry, The Master in the Education from Vinicius. Uh, this is not a spirit, it's an incarnate person that passed away alre already. Now he's a spirit in the spiritual realm. But at that time when he wrote, he was incarnated. And uh, in the chapter, Master and Savior, he says, Master is the one who educates. To educate is to appeal to the potentials of the soul. Mm -hmm. So education, when we, s we talk about education in spiritism, we're not talking about going to college. We're talking about the potentials of the soul. And I read something very interesting just you know, before uh, uh, leaving home about education. Uh, the, the person that wrote, wrote the article said that he met someone in, in Scotland and this man was uneducated. He just quit school when he was, I think, elementary school. And he is now a very successful uh, entrepreneur. And uh, he was like, well, but how did you succeed? And he said, well, you know, education today is not about teaching you to be independent, creative, and someone that can do something. Education today means prepare. And prepare means, you know, memory, knowing how to repeat things, but you are not autonomy, you are not independent, you don't, we don't learn anything, just learn techniques, but you cannot take these techniques and transform them and create a new thing, we are unable to do this with the education that we have nowadays. So it's that kind of education that Vinicius is talking about, the education that Kardec talks about, the education that Jesus talked about, is developing our potential, our spiritual potential, as Creative beings, because uh, if we have something that God gave us, was creativity. So, before these potentials, the disciple analyzes, inquires, discerns, retains, and learns. In order for the communion be between the master and the disciple to happen, it is absolutely indispensable for the, for the cooperation of both. The term communion means intimate relation between two or more individuals identified with the same purpose. So this is very interesting because why we don't feel yet Jesus as we could? Because we don't have this communion. You know, we see Jesus as this, you know, all, all, almost... Uh, uh, a myth and we don't relate to him so we don't take advantage of things that he brought to us that could free ourselves from our imperfection and our unawareness and everything else so Jesus is always there always 
when we feel horrible, when we feel weak, when we feel depressed, when we feel whatever, Jesus is just beside us. But he can do nothing if I cannot relate to him, if I cannot be in communion, create this relationship with him. It's up to me, up to myself to do this. It's not up to him to force something on me. He's there just waiting, waiting for us. And uh, in the book, Paul and Stephen, this book here from Emmanuel and Chico Xavier, uh, this is the story of St. Paul and St. Uh, Stephen. And uh, when Paul met Jesus, he had this inner transformation. He understood things better. And he decided to work now, follow Jesus, work for Jesus. But things were not easy for him. First, he thought, well, I'm one of, uh, one of the most important Pharisees of Jerusalem. So it will, it, it will be very easy for me just to preach and bring Jesus' ideas to everybody. I will convert everybody. He was full of himself. And uh, then he was in, in, in Damas Road, very close to the gate to enter the city. But he became blind because Jesus' light was so bright that he became blind. And Jesus said, well, enter the city and wait because someone will come to rescue you and help you. So three days later, a man, a Christian man that he was going to Damas to kill him, came and cure him. He could see again. And then he, you know, he was so strong and so positive and said, well, I'm going to the synagogue. I'm going to preach there. And he went there and he was almost stoned. Mm -hmm. And he felt for the first time that things would not be so easy as he thought because now he was no longer this powerful Pharisee. Now he was the greatest uh, uh, betrayer of the race. The Israel. So he was hatred by all the Jews now. So he realized, well, it will be a very hard task. And then he kept trying, kept trying, and nothing happened. He didn't succeed. So he thought, well, I'm going back to Tarsus, my city, and see my family. Then I can have this uh, comfort and, uh, you know, getting my strength back, and then I start working. He got to Tarsus, and he was expelled by everyone. All his friends were Jews also, against Jesus. And they thought, well, you were crazy. Don't come here again to talk about Jesus. If you come back to your reason, okay, but otherwise you just go away. And then he, he goes to his house to talk to his father, and his, the father did the same. You have to choose between Christ and me. And he said, I cannot choose. And he just left. Well, now he was completely alone in this world because all the Jews were hating him and trying to kill him. All the Christians feared him because they said, well, this is a smart guy. He's you know, pretending he became a Christian to kill herself. Mm -hmm. So now nobody would believe him. And he was completely alone in the world. Don't know how, what to do. Then he's walking in a, a road and uh, the, the night fall and he was there praying, asking Jesus to help him to understand what should he do. And... Um, then he start, you know, he entered this uh, uh, state of mind where he connected to the spiritual realm and he saw Abigail, his ex uh, uh, fiance, and Stephen, her brother, that was stoned by Paul's uh, uh, commandment. 
And then he is in this state of mind, like discouraged, feeling that you know the task before him is too big for him, and he cannot accomplish. And then mentally he start, you know, bringing all these questions, and uh, Abigail answer him with short, just one word. And then he asked how to really understand Jesus' uh, um, proposal to my life. And then she brings the first answer, love. If we love, we are doing what Jesus did, what Jesus said, what Jesus preached. So love, if you love, if you develop your potential to love, you are understanding what Jesus taught. And said, well, okay, but what, how can I really uh, put this to, to work? How, what can I do? And she said, work, act, do something. Because when we do something, it's this little seed that will blossom in Jesus' hand. So we start doing something and then Jesus will multiply. So first love and then work unceasingly. Keep working. Doesn't matter what happened to you. Keep working because then Jesus will come and help you, will support you. This is the connection between the master and the disciple that Denisus talked about. It happens in the action. It doesn't happen only in our mind. And then he says, well, what if I love, I'm working, but how can I really never uh, give up? And she said, well, wait. And this wait is wait indefinitely. There is no time to wait. Always wait. Because as the Spirit say, we sow, but we never know when we can gather. Because only God knows when the result of our actions will come. And doesn't matter for us. Because we are not waiting anything. We are just working. We are just doing without waiting any reward. So it doesn't matter. Just wait. Keep work and wait for better times. Because better times will come anyway. We, we don't know when, but will come. And then he says, if I do everything, but how can I overcome man uh, uh, um, violence and man uh, uh, ill will? And she said, forgive. If you forgive man, their ill will, their violence, you will never be reached by their violence, by their ill will. So then she leaves and, and leave him with these four uh, advices, powerful advices that's very beautiful, not for Paul, for us. So this is a very powerful formula for everyone here, for our lives. This solves any problem and we will build our connection, our communion with Jesus and we will start feeling more uh, Jesus beside us at all moments. And then coming closer to our time because she could just passed away 10 years ago so it's a, a, a real Christian that followed the four steps that Abigail gave to Paulo that follow all Jesus teachings and became this powerful example of charity of uh, uh, selflessness 
And this book, Beautiful Cases of Chico Xavier, of Ramiro Gama, we have many cases, many anecdotes about his life. Uh, first of all, all of them, we have the case when he was just four or five years old, a little, little boy. And his mother passed away and he went to live with his godmother because they were so uh, a huge family. So the father could not keep all the kids together. So he went to live with his godmother, but she was obsessed. She was really someone that ha have, um, has lost her mind. And she thought that Chico was possessed. And the way to free himself from possession was beating him once a day, and not only taking the forks mm. and putting the forks in his skin in a way that the fork would, would stay there. Don't ask me how, but she did almost every day. Why? And then he, as a medium, since childhood he was a medium, he would go to the backyard and there crying, he would pray, asking his mother to come and help him. And the mother would come every day and talk to him, to comfort him, to give him courage. So because of this kind of things that he endured his whole life, he became so uh, 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 courageous and so powerful in his way of, you know, enduring things in his life that he really felt that connection with Jesus because everything that he did, he knew that was God's will for a purpose. And he should be courageous, not to show the world that he was courageous, but for himself to be courageous enough to face anything that life would bring to him. And this is for us also, because life will bring many challenges for us. If we don't have the courage to face them, if we, wanna, if we are waiting for this beautiful life forever, no problem, no challenging, we're going to be disillusioned because hard times will come, always. Being reincarnated in this planet means that we came to face challenges. Not to suffer, not to feel like, oh, I'm suffering, that's good, then I, I will uh, go uh, uh, right to heaven after that. It's not that at all. It's realistic. There is no one in that world that passes the whole life without challenges. Challenges will come. The best way to face challenges are being courageous and facing them, you know, not thinking that, oh, God is punishing me, I'm a, 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 you know, a terrible person that don't deserve anything. No, we are here to fight for our survival, for our happiness, for our, healthy, uh, for our health. But we have to understand that in order for us to achieve this, we have to be courageous. Understand things like just normal uh, incidents in our lives that everybody uh, go through. And then we have the case of the blind homeless man who fell from a bridge. This, uh, his city was a small city and all, everybody knew him. <coughs> and uh, this blind homeless fell down from a bridge like, uh, uh, I don't know, in feet, maybe 20 or 30 feet high. And he was there bleeding and uh, with broken arm. And someone passed by and saw the man. Well, when, s when we, we are, you know, facing a situation like this, we were sent there to do something. If it happens before me, it's because it's my time to do something. But then this person passed and saw, and he thought, wow, I have to tell Chico. Chico is a good man, he will do something. And this person lost the opportunity to be helpful, to do something, to be connected with this loving energy of Jesus, of God, of all the, the good spirits. And then he rushed to call Chico. 
And Shiku, that always understood this, if something comes to me, is God calling me to do something, he didn't think twice. He went there, he helped the man, but this man was blind, homeless, and now he broke an arm, bleeding. He said, well, I have to take care of this, of this man till uh, 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 he recovered. So he had to rent the house to put this man there, and he was taking care of this man almost uh, 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 all day long, but he had to work. And then he called in the city, he put, he put some uh, posters calling people to help him. He needed help. One week, no answer. Not even the, the person that saw the man there didn't show up. One week later, two prostitutes came. Shiku, we are willing to help, but would you accept us? You know us. You know where we come from. And Shiku, my sisters, everybody's welcome to love and to be helpful. Of course I accept your, your help. During one month, they took care of this man. He recovered, and the last day, because each day when they changed the, the, the shift, when Shiko was working nighttime and the both uh, were, wor wor were working uh, daytime, when they met about six o'clock, they would say a prayer and another prayer at six in the morning. And one month later, not only the guy, the blind man was uh, uh, better, but the two prostitutes decided to change their lives. And they said, Shiku, by being here this last month, praying and taking care of our brother, we decided to change our lives. We are moving to the capital, and uh, she will be a nurse there. I will be, I'll be working in a laundry a store, and they changed their lives. Because of him that didn't refuse the work when the work came, because he understood that what was God calling him, he also changed two lives. And then the case of the watch and Miss Gloria. He would receive many gifts. Well, well not receive, but people would come with gifts and gifts and presents, etc. And he never accepted. But this man came and said, Chico, this watch is for you. I'm not accepting it back. You're going to keep it. And she said, okay, I keep it. And he kept. And he was, you know, fine. Wow, it's a beautiful watch. He was happy. And then he passed by Mrs. Gloria's house. And she, he stopped and asked her, Hey, Mrs. Gloria, how are you? <coughs> are you taking the medication the right time? As Dr. Bezerra de Menezes, the spirit, advised you? He said, well, Chico, you know, I'm so poor that I don't have any watch and I don't have, you know, money to buy one. Oh, but this is wonderful. This is yours. And he gave her the watch without thinking twice. Because he understood that, you know, we have nothing in this life. If he didn't need that, and the lady was in need of one, was hers, was not him, his. And, um, and this, after working until 2 or 3 p.m., or oh, a.m., almost every day in the spiritual center, with hundreds and hundreds of people in line waiting for him. And he there after working eight hours a day, walking almost one hour to go, one hour to come. And he was doing this because he understood the call. And he felt that this was what uh, uh, he was supposed to do. Of course, we are not saying that we all should do this, but how can uh, Jesus' teachings transform our life if we allow that, if we connect to Jesus? In the book, Jesus the Doctor, of José Carlos de Luca, uh, he says, it is never too late to change gears. Doesn't matter how much you have walked in error's road. Jesus didn't give up on you. The illness is a wake-up call for us to come back to the good path. Just like 2,000 years ago, Jesus, the doctor, is ready to heal you. What about you? Are you ready to make changes in your life? 
This is the question that the author asks us. Are we, are we ready to change gears, give up whatever we already understand that <coughs> is harmful? I'm not talking about people that are not aware. I'm talking about us, that we know Jesus, we know his teachings. Are we ready to make the changes we should do to be happier? That's the, the, the question that we should ask ourselves every day. If we are not ready, at least work on that. Because, again, Jesus is there. Jesus is always there. Jesus is not, you know, in heaven, far away in the other galaxy. Jesus is here. You know, just here with us. It's just a matter of connecting to him. In the same book, uh, the author talk, talks about Lazarus' resurrection when Jesus called Lazarus from, uh, uh, to come out of the grave. And he says, Do something good for your health. Do not put more stones in your tomb. Because at that time, you know, the, the tomb was the tomb. The tomb was like a kind of a cave with a door, and they would put this huge stone to close the entrance. So don't put more stones in this entrance. Uh, on the contrary, take them away from it so Jesus can resurrect you from your illness. The master is willing to do whatever in order to benefit you. However, if you don't take away the stone that caused your imbalance, how do you ask him to heal you? And uh, in, the, in this uh, chapter, he talks about, you know, Jesus came to the, to the tomb, but he didn't open the door. He didn't took the, the, the he didn't take the, the stone. He asked for his family to take out this stone. Oh, so he will not do everything. He will do his part. Our part, we have to do. It's just like kids. If we do everything for the kids, they will not grow. And then Jesus is the master in the modern times. Reading the four pillars for education from UNESCO, uh, we see how Jesus is so tuned with our time and the future times. Because his message is eternal. It's real for all the times. And you're going to see here, the four pillars for education are concepts a foundation of education based on the UNESCO, UNESCO's uh, report of the International Commission about Education for the 21st Century, coordinated by Jacques Delors. In the report issued in the format of a book, Education, a Treasury to be Discovered uh, of 1999, the discussion of the four pillars takes the whole chapter four, da -da -da -da, there, it is proposed that education should be direct to the four fundamental kinds of education. Learning to learn, learning to do, learning to live with others, learning to be. These were elected as the four fundamental pillars of education. The teaching process, as we know, as we know it, is essentially focused on learning to learn. That's what education is in our planet. Learn to learn, and less on learning to do. And he, in the in the book, he said uh, in this uh, article, the author says that, you know, we have learn to learn is the process that is going on in, in our schools, and then learn to do, in in a, uh, 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 in a less uh, important degree because we just learn you know, in the internships for quite some time, and then that's it. But it's not something in the education process. It's if you do the internship, otherwise you don't go through this uh, uh, learning. Um, uh, this learning process direct toward, directed toward the acquisition of instruments of comprehension reasoning and execution <laughs> cannot be considered complete without the other learning process domains. 
they are much more complex to explore due to their subjective characteristic dependent on the, dependent on the educational institution. And we have in the um, late uh, 18th century with Pestalozzi, his school was already there doing the four pillars. And our schools are based, most of them, in Pestalozzi's ideas. But we forgot the three other pillars and we got only the learning to learn. Let's see each one of them. And then, uh, this is a, a Brazilian author, uh, a uh, educator, a spiritist educator, and she said she did the, the, the connection between Jesus' teachings and each pillar. So the first pillar, learning to learn, she connects with the sentence, know the truth and the truth will set you free. This is in John chapter 8, uh, 32. And what the, the UNESCO uh, uh, report says, learning to learn demands to be open to the new, being amazed by the world, being in constant process of ob observation, sensing, being surprised by the contents life presents to us. Also, it requires an active attitude, the search for knowledge that involves study, research, and permanent intellectual effort. All of these will give us important answers, although partial and or temporary, about the world's contents. The search asks for inner liberation from prejudices, getting away from systematic skepticism that denies everything and from absolutism that reduces and freezes everything. Only the openness to the new, allied to a serious search for knowledge, will give to the evolving human being the critical thinking that situated us in the world and not before the world, apart the world, upon the world, or under it. Being in the world and with the world means identifying oneself with nature and with others. It means to dialogue with life while looking for its meaning. So we see that even learning to learn, what we have in our schools are far from it, are far. What we have in our schools is just instruction. Take, take it, take it, memorize it, memorize it. You have to know that because you have to pass this test, you have to do this. You have and we are not focused on the human being, human abilities that we will take everything that we will learn to put this to our service, not to pass tests. If you're studying to pass tests, it's a failure. Uh, so to be open to the new, being amazed by the world. So we see our, our scientific world so close to the new, so dogmatic, as we have talked here uh, on Tuesday meeting, that science, a part of the, 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 the science, is stuck because of the dogmatical way they see things. They are not open to the new. They are still in the 19th century. When those scientists at that time, when they became really focused on the matter, they were new, they were uh, uh, some, you know, they were like the, the reformers because they denied religion, we don't need that, let's now focus on the matter and the study matter, but they were doing something new. But then 150 years later, we are still doing the same way they did. So now we are surpassed, we are dogmatics, we are stuck. Thank God we always have the forerunners and we have many scientists coming open to the new, amazed by the world and doing so much uh, progress. So, and Jesus said that 2,000 years ago, know the truth and the truth will set you free. If we don't know that we are spirits, if we live here thinking that we are matter, that we are this body here, of course, 
all our understanding, all our goals will be totally different. If we don't know where we come from, where we are going to, what we are doing here, there is no way to set right goals, goals that will really be beneficial for us. And we will be living this illusion, this fantasy, that all that matters is this small and little world, poor world that we are living as material beings. We are much more. So knowing the truth will set us free because we will understand better. Learning to do. So the author connects to Jesus' uh, uh, teaching. Do it and you will live. This is in Luke 10, 28. Learning to do demands courage to execute, to take risks, to commit mistakes while trying to succeed. This is a permanent invitation to the discovery of more integra integrative methodology and instruments that respect other people's knowledges and their practices and help to overcome mere technicist formulas. This points to the necessity of including the human factor in all exist existential process that encompass thought, action, and feeling as a whole. It involves the testing of new hypotheses that signalize true changes and this imposes on humans the ability to overcome prejudices, repetitions, and also a responsible and realistic attitude to prepare the soil for a new sowing of new pathways. The ones who know, do it now, don't wait for it to happen, says an old Brazilian pop music song. It articulates knowledge and action in a dialectical process, so the first won't be vain and the second won't blind and be won't become blind and nonsensical. So again, if we learn and we don't apply what we learn, make no sense. If we learn something, it's to use that to do something. And it's better if we learn something good and do something good, of course, because we also uh, can uh, 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 learn something bad and do something bad. So that's uh, another thing. But everything that we learn is to be put in, in use, to do something, and not only to you know, make us more, uh, um, like, a, like the spirits say, we become a, like a, a flower. It's beautiful. OK, it's beautiful. It smells good. But so, what's the fruit? What is the fruit that will really uh, uh, um, uh, will feed someone else's life and our life also? So, and this we have to take risks. Many times we don't do things in our life because we are afraid of taking risks. My life is okay right now. I'm not doing anything because I don't want any change because, you know, it can be bad. I don't know what's going to happen. If it doesn't work, what I'm going to do? And then we don't do anything because we are afraid of taking the risks. Well, if we don't take the risks, we don't move. Learning to live with the other beings. And Jesus said, do unto others what you want others to do unto you. Matthew 7, 12. This is really away from our education, educational uh, institutions. Away. Even the teacher never connects to the, the, the students. I'm saying in a manner, uh, a general manner. Many of the teachers, most of the teachers, they don't care. I had teachers in, in the college that they will come to the class, sit down, take the book, and read. You know, but he was saying things that for us were like uh, uh, worse than, than Greek, because we were not, uh, not understanding anything. So he was a scientist. He was so, so deep 
and his subjects who are so good, but he could not talk to us. He was a teacher and he could not talk to the, 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 the students. He didn't care. He was there, he did his job, he came to the class, he left, uh, and that's it. So if we don't relate to our students, if we don't see them as human beings, that you know, each student will have a different experience, different needs. If we don't have this human uh, side of the, the educational process, education will never work. It doesn't matter if I'm teaching physics. I'm teaching physics to human beings, not teaching physics to the, to the planets or to the sun. I'm dealing with the f uh, people that have different needs. So we have to have this ability to deal with people. Pestalozzi, um, they say that, it is said that Pestalozzi was so deep into his students' life that they would see many times, you know, when we had these very difficult students that we have to go to the, uh, 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 the principal office, they would go to talk to Pestalozzi. And then people would see them coming out crying like babies because they felt so bad because they didn't respect Pestalozzi. And Pestalozzi will talk to them with so much love that they would cry. Not because Pestalozzi beat them, of course. Because <laughs> he loved so much them that they, they came to their minds and thought, oh my God, what I have done to you know, my best friend that I love so much. And they, they, they would change. The power of love. And he was a teacher. He was teaching astronomy, anatomy, uh, physics, chemistry, but he was a human being talk, talking to human beings also. Oh, I didn't read, right? Uh, learning to live with other, other beings implies in building a cultural and personal identity. To situate oneself with the other beings, sharing experiences and developing social responsibilities. The social experiences facilitate the access to knowledge, to action, to life in group, to the development of all our faculties. Through them, we acquire values, we assimilate practices and habits, we develop our abilities and attitudes, so that we define ourselves as humans, as persons, as individuals, in relation to other individuals, in a dynamic process that makes our constant improvement possible. These experiences generate responsibilities that leads us to a better interaction with nature, the commitment towards humanity, and help us to overcome collective and individual selfishness related to color, race, <coughs> gender, beliefs, social position, and geographical situation. Um, again, if we are learning to learn, learning to do, the reason, the first reason is to have this relationship with other human beings. Whatever I do, if I'm a, a, a doctor, if I'm a teacher, if I'm an actor, if I'm whatever, whatever I do is to relate to our human, other human beings. If I don't learn that from the beginning of <coughs> school, it will be very difficult. That's what happened today. We are these powerful minds, you know, using their knowledge and their, their uh, know-how to corruption, to uh, um, crimes, and etc. Very powerful minds. They didn't learn how to deal with others. He, they didn't learn how to deal, how to deal to uh, interact with nature. So they don't care about polluting and uh, spoiling the, the, the planet if they are getting their profits. Because they didn't learn that when they were kids. Learning how to deal with others, respect others, do unto others what you want others to do unto you. 2,000 years ago, Jesus was talking about. And still, we are not doing that. 
Um, so respecting and building culture and personal identity, all of this is only possible if we start doing this from the beginning, from the beginning, when we are little kids. And the last one, learning to be. Be perfect. That's the invitation. Learning to be perfect. That's what we are doing. We are learning how to be perfect. It's Matthew 5, 4, 8. Learning to be undoubtedly is the most important of all four principles. Look at this. It's the most important of all. If we are, we are okay. We are good. It highlights the necessity of overcoming the dualistic viewpoint on the human being, the fragmented perception of the educational process that comes from our limitations, prejudice, bad passions, unawareness, and pride that comes together. It contemplates human beings as whole creatures, especially in what refers to its unique and personal way of being. It involves all its dimensions, its thoughts, processes, its way of feeling, its way of acting in the, in the existential, existential context where he or she is situated. Human destiny is its perfectibility, which can only be achieved through experiences that provides it sim simultaneously with the knowledge of nature, of the other, and of itself. Realize that we are a whole being, bio, psych, social, and spiritual, penetrating in the essence of our humanity, taking possession of our divine inheritance, and becoming conscious of our condition of immoral beings are part of the process of learning to be on the Christian perspective. Again, as I have said, we are spirits, reincarnated now with this material body. How can I be a human being, a whole human being, if I only perceive one part of myself? I cannot be. I will be a handicapped human being, as we are. In a general manner, we are all handicapped because we focus in one part of ourselves because of our unawareness. So, for us to be this whole human being, happy, useful uh, uh, for society, at the service of others, pr uh, promoting progress, we have to know ourselves, our potentials, and develop them. By developing our potentials, we will be what we are destined to be. We are now in, in this uh, uh, building process. This is not our destiny. This is a, a uh, um, very, um, what's the word? Very um, partial vision of ourselves. So we are much more than this. So we have at least to know what we are and what potentials I have to be developed. Then I can start working because if I don't know is what we're going to see after this. If I don't know something, that thing doesn't exist to me. There is no existence, real existence to me because I don't know, I'm not aware, it doesn't exist. So. In order for us to go through this process, it's ne it is necessary for us to understand what we really are and what potentials I have to be developed. And Jesus gave us many clues. He said, you are the salt of the earth. You are gods. You are light. He said everything that we are in potential, potentially to be developed. But I know I am, I know that I can develop it, because if I don't believe that I can develop, I will never develop. I'll be, you know, as I, I, 
I have uh, some examples in my life, I think everybody has, that people that since I was born, they were already adults, they are exactly the same person, thinking the same way, doing the same thing, suffering for the same things. So it's unbelievable. But why? They don't know their potential. They think they were created like this, to die like this, and that's it. They have just to endure their uh, uh, sorte, how do you say? <laughs> their luck. Fate. Their fate. Endure their fate. I was born like this. You know, God made me like this. I can do nothing. So it is important for us to understand that we are perfect beings. Perfectible beings. And we are far away from our destiny as pure, healthy, happy spirits that we will be one day as we overcome little by little all these imperfections that we have. You know. And Kardec said, it is through education in its broader sense, what we just read in the UNESCO's uh, report. In its broader sense, much more than through instruction that humanity will be transformed. If instruction would transform the world, we would be in paradise now, in heaven, because there is no lack of instruction. All these colleges around the, the, the planet, these Yale and uh, Duke and uh, Harvard and Oxford, it doesn't solve any problem, well, some problems. Let's not say uh, uh, in a so pessimistic way. But the main problems in our society, which is violence, lack of love, disrespect, are still there. And we have all these PhDs and uh, all the colleges, they didn't solve the problem because the problem is not there. It's not in instruction. It's in the education, work in the four pillars. Then we will be... Uh, fine. Well, this is the bibliography and the electronic documents. So, Obras Postumas, which is Postum's works of Allan Kardec. Uh, Jesus in the, in the Home of Chico Xavier. Dias Venturosos with Blissful Days, de Valdo Franco. The Master in Education, Vinicius. Paul and Stephen, Chico Xavier. The Jesus the Doctor. Jose Carlos de Luca, and two uh, websites, one from UNESCO and the other one from a spiritual center in Brazil. Uh, and uh, before I call you, I would like to also show you this. Where and when Jesus was born. Brother X is the spirit and Chico Xavier the medium and he wrote like this let's ask oh it's in Portuguese Mary Mary Magdalene where and when Jesus was born and she will reply Jesus was born in Bethany when his voice so pure and sanctified woke on me the sensation of a new life with which I have never dreamed. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the next. Let's ask Francis of Assisi, what does he know of Jesus' birth? And he will answer. He was born the day when in Assisi Square I gave up my purse, my clothes, and even my name in order to follow him unconditionally as I knew that only him is the infinite source of love. Let's ask Peter when Jesus was born and where and where and he will say Jesus was born at, at the Caiaphas palaces pat patio when I heard the rooster three times after I denied him also three times was at that moment that my conscience woke up to the true life. Let's ask Paul of Tarsus when and where the birth of Jesus took place, and he will tell us. Jesus was born in Damas Road, 
when I saw him enveloped in such a bright light that blinded me for three days. Noble and serene, he asked, So, so, why do you persecute me? And through the blindness I could see a new world, and I asked, Lord, what do you want me to do? He says so, so, because po he changed his name to Paul later. Let's ask Joanna de Cusa where and when Jesus was born, and she will respond. Jesus was born the day when tied up to a pole in the Roman arena, I heard the crowd shouting, deny him, deny him. Then the soldier holding a torch in his hand said, your Christ only thought you how to die? At that moment, feeling the flames burning me, I could reply firmly and sincerely. No, he didn't teach, teach only this, but also to love you. And this is true, it's not uh, a... Let's ask ourselves, when and where Jesus born for us? That's the, the, the question that Brother X, the Spirit, asked by the end of the, the story. So he showed that Jesus is born only when we become conscious of his existence, or when in, thi in this case, is when his teachings really penetrate ourselves and did something for ourselves. Because Peter, Peter lived with Jesus before the crucifixion, three years before. During three, three years, he was living almost daily with Jesus. He knew Jesus. But only when denying him, when the, the Pharisees asked him, Oh, I know you. You are one of his followers. And Jesus was already uh, uh, being crucified. And said, no, no, I never met him. Three times. And the third time, as Jesus predicted to him, the rooster, what did the rooster do? Crow? Three times. Then he realized the master knew. At that time, he understood better and from that time on, he became the Peter we know that gave up his life to really work for humanity, serving humanity. So each one of us will have our own time. Maybe we only know Jesus for now. He is not born yet for ourselves. So let's prepare the, the cradle for him to be born within ourselves. Maybe we are pregnant. <laughs> He's about to be born. But we have to take care of the little baby. And uh, as it happens to his life, he was born as a little baby, as all you know, normal human beings. He was a child, he grew up, he was a teenager, and then he became an adult. Same thing will happen to us. You know, at first, Jesus will be a, just a baby. If I don't take care of him, he will die. When I get to know him and the teachings do something within myself, if I don't take care of this, this will disappear, you know, mixed with all the things that I have within myself, then I'll, I'll put him uh, aside. So. Let's prepare this inner place where he can be born if he is not born yet. But we have to really be open to the new and open to this birth that will take place one day that will not be in December 25th. I don't know if uh, someone here doesn't know that the date December 25th was chose, uh, chosen was chosen because in, in the Roman Empire that date was a very important celebration of you know the the the, the sun that from that day on would come back because that day is the day or about the time 
when the sun starts coming back, the days are larger from that day on. To that day, the days are just decreasing in time. The 25th, 24th, the days start getting bigger again. So they chose that day to make Jesus important in the Roman Empire that became Christian about the fourth century. The empire became Christian. So to impose the new God, Jesus as a new God for the Roman Empire, they chose that date because they said, well, we are already celebrating this huge holiday, so this will be the day that the new God was born. So it's just some adaptations. It doesn't matter the day he was really born. What matters is that the day that he will be born for us, within ourselves.